<laughs> Good morning, digital wildcatters. See how I did that? Like yeah, we're recording cool, in the afternoon, but we went straight to good morning. I'm so confused. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're all confused. It's good afternoon on Monday. We dropped this Tuesday morning, though. So this is... Uh, this and is, some fans want a live show, Chuck. That's true. We tried that for a while. We we had our issues. Is it because I got naked a few times? <laughs> Probably. Uh -huh. <laughs> the the worst part of that about that is you weren't actually in the studio. You were outside the window. <laughs> Part you exactly let me in. Partners in crime, Kirk Coburn, Mark Meyer, Mark from are you disclosing your private location? Barrington, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. Gotcha. I thought we had sent you to the bunker in case something yeah, happened. You know, <laughs> the uh, the cabinet member that you know, goes there during the. Uh, I don't think many State of our of listeners don't know this, but Mark is actually a songwriter. No, that is true. Music producer and big producer. big fan of country music. So I was having a big, uh, big, big, big fan of music. I was music, having brunch true. in his neck of the woods up in South Dallas the other last week, actually. And I took a picture of a, of where, of the breakfast joint. And all it showed is like a stage with a guitar. And, and he knew exactly where I was, knew exactly what seat I was sitting in and said, where the, why the hell are you up here and didn't call me? Nice. Was that Dosido? -Do? Dosido. -Do, the Do -Do. the breakfast, the Dosido -Do Junior, or what's it called? It's the uh, breakfast place and whiskey bar. That's they, right. They just added the whiskey bar. And the big barn is what they call the main venue, which was, oh, it's been 15 years ago. Uh, it's actually a reassembled uh, Kentucky tobacco barn that's very old and, and you know acoustics in that place are fantastic and they've they've become quite a draw uh, nationally and certainly from uh, from Nashville you see a lot of see a lot of pretty big headliners gotcha all right well real quick before we jump in I have a point to the uniform I'm wearing today there is a coffee place in Richmond, Texas, Blockhouse. It's two blocks from my house, so it's not uncommon on a weekend that I will go out for a run, a walk, whatever. A stroll, if you a will. A stroll. Tell my daughters, when y'all wake up, text me, we'll all meet at Blockhouse. We do that yesterday. We're inside eating, and I'm like, how'd y'all get here? Sarah drove. Sarah drove her sister two blocks, so... <laughs> My my anti hydrocarbon children, I was a little snarky at the end of breakfast. I said, Dad's gonna go ahead and walk home because I care about the environment and I don't want to pollute. And I never would have driven two blocks. And Sarah Yates looked at me and said, Dad, your hat says Petro and your shirt says Stallion Energy. I'm really not buying that shit. <laughs> Fair enough. Kids. All right. August 16th, which is better known as the date that Pete Best was fired as the Beatles drummer. A year ago, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Kirk laid on us. Yeah, one year anniversary, which is interesting. I, I Googled it because I was trying to find like, what do we know about the one year anniversary? The White House made a great press conference and a press release, but all the lives are saving. It is the largest and most Largest bill ever enacted for clean energy, if you will. Um, I tried to find something negative about it. And um, I found only one thing negative about the IRA what was on it? one year anniversary. And it's, uh, it's on Twitter from Social Security Works. <laughs> and this is, quote, every single Republican voted against the Inflation Reduction Act. That's what they said. Like, that was it. Everyone's saying how great it is. Of course, everyone on Biden's side is saying how this is the best thing that's ever happened. Right. But Social Security Works comes out and just wants everyone to remember that every single Republican <laughs> voted against. So that's the one negative thing I could find about. It. Well, you know, uh, other, beyond that, the name is is would be another negative. The actual <laughs> name of. The inflation. Well, the Biden fact that has nothing to do with inflation. Yeah, and Biden finally came out and said that. Uh, oh, by the way, we maybe shouldn't have called it that, but it's uh, wild. The on. grab bag that's in there. You know, it's got an alternative minimum tax on corporations. Had a one percent excise tax on stock buybacks. That's the whole eighty thousand new agents or whatever it is for that's the right. IRS. 
And then just all these green Healthcare, energy ha- tax. capping, senior drug prescription costs. costs. I mean, it's, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of pork in there. Yeah, the I was listening to a podcast this morning talking about the one year anniversary and the guys were very pro clean energy and their take was 60% of it was good stuff and we have to stomach the remaining 40% of it. That was kind of their take. Yeah, and, and the I listened to that as well and the the negatives in the 40% mainly had to do with CCS and direct air. Um they, which they there, were. Yeah, because there is room in the bill for CCS, which is interesting because we're going to come to another story about that. Actually. Yeah, the, they they were wistful about it because they're saying the Europeans are looking over the over the pond, saying, "Look, <laughs> they're doing a lot. We need to we need to get off the high center here and do some things that actually bring clean manufacturing uh, in into uh, into the UK and Europe, and otherwise they're going to get left behind." So. There were lot, l- lots to unpack there over time. It's going to give us lots to talk about over the next. They were they were lamenting the fact that they've got a bunch of hydrogen fuel cell companies over in Europe, and we're getting to do all the cool battery <laughs> right. stuff. And I was just like, I've got okay, a hydrogen guys. deal. We'll talk about perfect. All right, let's go one quick round across the table. Kirk, I'll go to you first. Give us one thought on the IRA prediction. Something. Well, I think it's 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 definitely a kickstart and given, you know, wind behind clean energy projects. But we talked over the last few weeks how a lot of these projects are at a standstill because of timelines, approvals. So I, I don't actually see the IRA. I'm not sure in 10 years if we're going to look back and saying it's just a big waste of money um, because private organizations have already put into place, you know, the EV angle, but we're talked about how we're going to see a huge slowdown in EV adoption because of charging infrastructure. We have a grid problem. So it'll be interesting to see if, if everything can catch up to the IRA. I, I don't think so. So m- my prediction is, is um, that it's going to be a wish wash. Wish wash. Mark, thought, prediction, something? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have some blow ups. I, I think it's going to take longer uh, to build and, and deploy all this for reasons that Kirk cited, mainly related to, you know, the synchronization of the grid and the infrastructure build out. And, you know, the market will take care of a lot of it as it, as it has in the past. Um, ultimately these things need to stand on their own. And unless we get into a situation where we really start to force things in terms of consumer choice, then, you know, I think that's a pretty good, um, somewhat Darwinian mechanism that is somewhat uh, insulated by the fact that you've got all of these uh, incentives and subsidies in, in, in the middle of the whole process. So my, but I think it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot longer. So my barometer on whether something's good or bad is how much censorship is required to support <laughs> it. And so I went to Google today and I, Googled IRA reflections wait, after. Wait, wait, that's only one watt per Google search. So one if watt. you used AI, it would, it would have been, been five, five watts. And Chat GPT only runs through 2021, I think, so far. So, so you were actually doing, you're being environmental. Today. I, was, I was being environmentally you, freely, the, the one watt. So I Googled <laughs> IRA reflections after a year or, you know, reviews after a year or something. I literally after pages and pages of searches, got to a story about the Irish Republican Army before I got a negative criticism on the IRA. So if Google has to censor negative criticism, it's just got to be bad. That's my take. (laughs) All right, number two story, Permian Resources buying Earthstone Energy. Mark, you got any thoughts on this deal? Um. You're the one that populated the uh, show notes with with the metrics. I have not had a chance to kind of dig into the details, so I'll flip it back to you. Okay. So basically, you got Permian Resources, and they're buying Earthstone. It's creating a $14 billion company. It's a stock-for-stock deal, so you get almost a share and a half of Permian Resources for your your Earthstone stock. You know, the press release was kind of typical of what we've seen in a lot of these things. We've seen mergers and we hear 
mm-hmm. accretion synergies, accretion synergies, $175 million of annual, annual synergies they talked about. We could see this one coming because mm-hmm. Earthstone, we talked a few weeks ago about small cap companies not wanting to sell. Well, Earthstone had a lot of private equity backers. I think NCAP was in it, et cetera. They need to get their cash back they, to they, yeah. raise another fund. And and how do they do that? They merge so they have more liquidity. So hopefully they can dump this stock in the market over time. Earthstone was just over 130,000 barrels a day combined. This is a 300,000 barrel a day BOE per day company, 400,000 acres. You know, you got to give uh, credit to Earthstone. They were founded by Frank Lodzinski. And if you haven't met Frank, he's a great guy. He is an accountant. And he's the only person in oil and gas that I've ever heard of talks about net income matters. And when he would wow. buy something, he would run mm-hmm. out depreciation. If he wasn't generating net income, he just wouldn't do it. Very disciplined. His kind of right-hand man was Robert Anderson, who's a great guy, really good engineer. Robert took over the last few years. So if you look at it, basically Earthstone stock price doubled over the last five years. The XOP, the oil and gas uh, ETF, has basically been flat over that time. So kudos to Earthstone for uh, for selling and giving their shareholders a double. I mean, I'm just curious, so, Chuck, over who are the investment bankers? Maybe it's the private equity guys, but who are the investment bankers that are getting in and pitching these deals? Or is it just two companies being or Two companies just being wise and and doing it themselves. Chuck, what say you? The, That's your world. You know, I th- I think a lot of the public to public stuff. Everybody knows each other. Everybody goes and gets cocktails <clears throat> together, and just something. At Midland kind Country of, Club or Midland Country Club. They go to uh, they go to you know uh, a soccer game and sit in somebody's suite in Austin. Maybe you know they do <laughs> they do things like this. And, you know, when the time hits, the board says something. I don't know how much actual process shopping there is because everybody just knows each other in that world. But uh, potentially it'd be great to have Will or Robert come on the podcast and, and see if they'd talk about They're it. They're invited. Uh, I will say this, the, the merger proxy that comes out, because I'll have to get a vote. Will give us some of those details, so we should probably read it. So when they come on, should I push Joe Rogan off the show? Oh yeah, probably okay. so. All right, again, Mark. Well, uh, yeah, I keeps getting bombed. Yeah, yeah a couple of things. Uh, we have finally found the only person who read my first research report, <laughs> <laughs> part of which was entitled "Earnings Matter." <laughs> um, you know, I think. Uh, I think too the uh, it's it's interesting to see these cases where the large private equity sponsor who's selling tech stock and you know ha- have some of that ongoing liquidity uncertainty, but it also speaks to I think the uh, the quality of of the acquirer and and the you know the the, the execution that that they have um, certainly demonstrated over the the course of their life as well. So I think. <clears throat> You think we see more of this? I think I think we have Chuck. to. I mean, I think we have to. At the end of the day, there's no reason that EMP companies shouldn't be like cell phone companies. Maybe there are six of them. I, the I mean, I think States. there's so much risk with if you look at the even the political environment and what's happening. I, I we I do expect a a massive recession next year. I think we're headed that direction. I see a administration that'll probably continue. Maybe not, but if, if they continue. There's going to be more and more pressure, and I think having a bigger balance sheet is going to be helpful and stronger lobbyists as well. Well, you know, I was listening to Mark Andreessen on Joe Rogan. That happened in July, but it just kind of made it to my my playlist this weekend when I was out um, running my stroll, as you say. And one of the things Andreessen talked about was financial meltdown. And they passed Dodd-Frank because these big banks were too big to fail. And Dodd-Frank's intention was to break up these big banks and make Mm -hmm. it easier to start small banks. Fast forward to today, we've got a handful of really big banks and we haven't started a bank in five years. Yeah, Silicon Valley Bank was a, a, the big guys need to come in and save the little guys. Yeah. And so, you know, basically you have the unholy alliance between big business and government and people go back and forth the whole time and they're kind of in bed together. 
And I think you're right. If we're going to continue to be regulated more and more, potentially out of business, you're going to have to get bigger and bigger and have clout with the government so you can have that detente. And five guys in a rusty pickup truck just aren't going to happen anymore. I agree. And that's bad because guess who brought the shale revolution to the world? Five guys in a rusty pickup truck. It was not the majors. So, um, story number three, Utah and Oregon GPS mandates for electric vehicles. Kirk, what say you? I mean, and, and basically gasoline taxes are there to generate revenue for road maintenance. That's what they're the purpose. Now, EVs aren't buying The more it. gasoline you use, the more you pay in taxes, the more exactly. you use the roads. Yeah, that but, makes but, sense. But the rise of EVs, they're not paying their fair share, according to according to a few states. So Utah and Oregon are mandating these GPS. They just voted to mandate GPS trackers so they can charge EVs on a per mile fee. Now, um, this also in, in, in Utah... They also assign a driver score based on driving behavior. So if you know quite a few of us that own EVs, our driving behavior has gotten, well, I mean, we go as fast as, I mean, they're fast as hell. So <laughs> we drive like, like, like maniacs. So that's the, the purpose is to give the fair share. Now we know the EVs are heavier. They're worse for the roads because they create more damage to the infrastructure. So it's an interesting play. But when you say, start thinking about tracking, then you start setting off tinfoil hat wares, which is, I'm in that camp right now. It's like the government wants to track you with digital currency, tracking your car. Hell no, or is anyone going to put a GPS? I already have one. It's called a phone, and they can already track me. But um, Well, but the subtlety there, and we've talked <clears throat> about this on, on BDE, is right now the chip in our phone that tracks us, the government does have to go get a court Subpoena. order. Yeah, they've got to be it's got to mm -hmm. be subpoenaed. A judge has to sign off on it. Now, we've all seen that judges are willing to do stuff like that, but they at least have to do this. I think to this to the point these programs are normalizing tracking. And what I found really interesting is if you had to say what is our most conservative state in the union, maybe it's Utah, maybe you know, maybe yeah, it's Texas, it's maybe it's Florida, but it's certainly up there. What is our most liberal? Could be Oregon. California. Yeah. So you have opposite ends of the spectrum, both of them wanting to track us. So it's not a Republican yeah. or a Democrat issue. No, it's a it's a government versus it, the people and, issue. And and the interesting thing in these two examples in the piloting, this is essentially a piloting step. One is mandatory and one is one is voluntary. Of course, you can imagine the uptake or lack thereof in the in the voluntary one. Guess which one is mandatory? Oregon, and no, it's a, Oregon's Utah. the no Oregon's the volunteer. I'm sorry, right? Which is which is a bit surprising if if you think about the <laughs> the, the political spectrum that Chuck just just described. Yeah, and and it was you know I I saw it posted on LinkedIn and it was in a, a widely read and widely disseminated publication called Axel Addict, and, and it was a very short article and they did have space for first reactions and comments, and they were all exactly along the lines of what, what you were describing, Kurt, in terms of this isn't just about, you know, paying our fair share as EV drivers. There's a there's kind of a slippery slippery slope of privacy and tracking here. If I live in Utah, they're like, Kirk, you drove zero miles? Yep, because I tear <laughs> that GPS right out. Now, because, and I might start a, that's a great idea. Like, instead of sort of the local radio guys that you go to to put in that cool sound system, and those guys are always like installing stolen equipment. I'm going to have a business where we just de like we we change the GPS unit, nice. and we give it false data. I could do that. It's probably legal. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but what's interesting about the Oregon approach? You would think that Oregon would be mandated and Utah would be voluntary, but in Oregon. There, this sounds very Oregonian to me. They allow drivers to volunteer for a per mile fee system. So the each and because doesn't that sound so like Oregon happy? Like, what do you think you should pay? Like, oh, I should pay two cents per mile versus it's hilarious. So that's not going to last. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's happening, and we've talked about it on BD. And Michigan is exploring 
watching both programs. So yeah. Michigan's in the hunt as well. Yeah. Crazy. So Mark, you texted the story this weekend and uh, I don't even know what to make of it, but cruise cars are wreaking havoc in San Francisco. Like, San Francisco has people urinating on the street. Let's just go ahead and throw <laughs> throw autonomous cars in the mix to screw things up. So, so last Thursday, there was an incident involving a cruise autonomous taxi that had a passenger in it. And it was approaching an intersection at which it had a green light and right of way in its lane. But there was a fire truck coming the other way. And it's, and it's a fairly complex kind of nuanced um limited visibility at points in this intersection, the car, the autonomous taxi and the technology recognized it, initiated braking to, to slow the vehicle down, but couldn't avoid the head on with a fire truck that had crossed over into the oncoming lane to get through the intersection on its way to an emergency. So as a result of this, and, and apparently after a music festival, um, really same week, I believe, there were several of Cruz's autonomous vehicles that got stuck in the middle of traffic and created quite a, a traffic snarl. And that was because, you know, the density of the crowd at the event kind of strains the bandwidth. And so there was there was a delay in getting instructions to the autonomous vehicles and so created quite a bit of a, uh, a traffic problem. And as a result of all this, the Department of Motor Vehicles, mainly because of the ongoing investigation into the emergency vehicle crash, the DMV in California has asked uh, crews to reduce the number of their taxis by 50% on a daily basis uh, until the uh, conclusion of the investigation. And, and crews, I think, announced today that they're, you know, a couple of days ago that they're going to comply with that. They go to 50 uh, vehicles during the day and 150 at night. Well, I mean, you, you say crews around me, I've got um, flashes back to Vietnam. Uh, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But um, foreshadowing. Cruise is the damn company when my charger broke at home. I no longer have my EV. I sold it. <laughs> I, I have such rings anxiety and anger over the charging problem, which I'm starting a company to fix that. We'll talk about that at another show. Um, it's when, There's only really one fast charging center in the middle. That's non-Tesla. I mean, Tesla dominates. They know how to do it. But the rest of us have to use non-Tesla fast chargers. There's really one fast charging station in the center of Houston. And when you go there to charge, Cruise is taking up every damn spot. So Cruise is in Houston, if you didn't know that. And they're taking all the charging spots. And that's happened five times I've gone there. So I don't want to have EV anymore. I don't like the experience. But the Cruise, those mother effers are in our way. Yeah, no, it's uh, we all sit there and we think, okay, we're just going to change to electric vehicles. The history of energy is always about building on the existing infrastructure. Right. And to some degree, we've had to do this from ground zero. I still don't understand why Bucky's doesn't have charging stations for electric vehicles, you know? Right. So, but what's interesting, I, I will say, give it, give them some of the benefit of the doubt. Why doesn't Cruise and Waymo have like remote control command centers? Like when the car's stuck in the middle, they have to send someone out to go figure out what to do. Why isn't someone in somewhere away watching a monitor going like, let me just remote control this car out of the way? Yeah. They can do that. Yeah. Why I mean, don't they do it? I mean, that's how we basically fly drones and bomb people and, you know, all yeah. around the world. So I don't know. I don't know, but fun to watch. The The line I like best about uh, autonomous driving cars is that the sensors basically have the sophistication of a drunk sophomore in college driving. <laughs> <laughs> and, and before you laugh too much at that, and I'm not condoning drunk driving in any way, shape, or form, but drunk sophomores actually aren't that bad of drivers. In the grand scheme of things. Wow, that's going to come back and haunt you, Chuck. Well, but I did not mean to condone it in any way, shape, or form. But Damn. yeah, no, it is that level. That's where the sensors Unless are. Unless you're trying to get mad to sponsor a show. Yes. Well, right. it's it's not a sophomore, uh, not a software artificial intelligence issue. It's literally the sensors that that are probably the bigger problem at this point. But anyway, 
All right. So basically they have the, as much control as you and me right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the, the old boomer. All right. Let's stick with cars. Vinfast merged with SPAC partner Black Spade. And They're found in 2017, had a valuation over $85 billion on its NASDAQ debut. They're a Vietnamese EV car company. Who knew? And, you know, the whole kind of crazy, I mean, we all, just a quick refresher on how a SPAC works. SPAC goes public at 10. Basically, the deal with the shareholders is we'll find a deal to merge with. Come to you. You can vote to do it. Great. If you don't want to do it, shoot it down and we won't do it. That's how it works. So it's technically a merger. People figured out it's actually a better way to go public because when you go public in the S1, you cannot provide projections. You can't do any sort of future looking stuff. In a merger, you can do a private placement and provide all those projections. So that's why a lot of uh, these things I work. don't like SPACs for many reasons. And uh, and I've written a, a pretty good blog on this, but we'll, we'll go through that. I'll let that slide for now, but a little bit more information about Vin Fast. It's owned by Vin Group, Vietnam's largest corporate conglomerate. Who knew? The company began delivering its electric SUV, the VF8 in US in March. Vin Fast CEO is Li Ti Tu Ti Tai. Excuse me for the, I should know this since we have a, the second largest Vietnamese population here in Houston. Emphasize the company's commitment to sustainable mobility. And now it's the largest U.S. listed Vietnamese company by market cap. Yeah. And, and I mean, those, so it's been public now or trading for a week. I think it, it hit as high as $37 a share. And when it hit, it's at 17 ish today. When it hit 37, it was bigger than Ford and, you know, all, know. The, and all, these, all these other car yeah, companies. It, it talked about VinFast. Uh, I saw a headline today, you know, Vinfast CEO loses $15 billion <laughs> from, <laughs> from where the stock peaked. Uh, she owns, what, 99% of the equity? Yeah. Is that? That's uh, the, C, the, the, it's owned by Pham Nat Vuong, Vietnamese richest individual. But the reviews for the VF8 models were largely been negative, which is, brings me to the question about the Genesis. Is that sort of the same negativity of the Genesis or are those two separate? Uh, look at you <laughs> digging in on me. Anytime you read a review about a Genesis car, the first sentence is always, they hired the designer from Bentley. They buy their leather from the same place Bentley buys their leather. And then it talks about what an amazing car it is. And the last sentence is always, you just have to get over the mental hurdle of driving a Hyundai. I would love to have Genesis sponsor the show. And if I'm they a do, happy I'll plug, G, I'll plug I'm, a, it. I'm a happy G80 driver. I love my car. I really do. Oh, it's over, it's right now, over the former Tesla? Um, Ooh, I see. Well, it's, a, it's a clue. Well, the, the Tesla, Tesla is an amazing piece of equipment. I paid 140000 for the Tesla. I paid 50000 for the for the G80. Uh, right. So Fair enough. Va value buy was the uh, the G80. Here's the, here's the bet on this so, whole fa SPAC story. The company aims to sell 50,000 vehicles this year, but has only shipped about 11,000 so far. Are they going to hit the number, Mark? <laughs> well, <clears throat> they're building a factory in North Carolina. And I, I saw a comparative with the Tesla Model Y, which I guess compares with their five seater, which is priced. The VinFast is priced twelve to fourteen hundred dollars under the Model Y, but until it's manufactured in the U.S., doesn't qualify for the seventy five hundred dollar credit under uh, the IRA. Yeah. So I'll take the under on on any kind of near term targets. And I don't know what the timeline for that factory to be operational is. I think it's 2025, but don't quote me on that. So I think, I think VinFast. Oh, back, back to that podcast you referenced, um, Chuck, the podcaster in Dublin was expressing amazement at how a relatively short span of time between last trip and, and this trip, it went from almost no EVs on the road to a lot of them. Mm. And Dubliners are buying Chinese, Korean, and I think even Vietnamese EVs. And so 
it'll be interesting to see how the American market, American consumer responds once, you know, VenFast gets up on full production in the U S and it it can compete with, um, with some more models that, that do qualify for the $7,500 tax credit. In the old days when expect on Saturdays, my parents would take me when they were car shopping to car dealerships and they would serve hot dogs. <laughs> and I loved hot dogs and Cokes. It was awesome. If, if this, if this, if VinFast serves Bon Mies at their, at their dealership, <laughs> I'm going and I will You're test there. drive one until I get at least two or three of those sandwiches. Don't think I'll buy a car, but <laughs> cause I'm in the market, but I will go test drive one. So as you were reminiscing about, uh, <laughs> car trips of your, I'm kind of reminiscing about the glory days of the SPAC, you know, oh, where right. you would merge. The first trade was 2X the uh, the price. I'm kind of wondering if maybe VinFast is like Funky Town by Lips. You know, that was Disco's <laughs> last stand, right? That was the end of Disco right there. But man, that was a great song. Hopefully... Uh, Hopefully we'll uh, we'll we'll see more. But uh, what was that drug that would make people skinny and it killed a bunch of people? Remember, it reminds me of this. I think it had fast in the name. It's not slim fast. It was oh else. yeah yeah yeah. I forget. I forget. I will bring that up. Next we time. won't. All right. On to saving the planet. Mm -hmm. Oxy buys carbon engineering for one point one billion. Three equal payments. Mark, are they going to save the planet? You know, I think technically, um, when, when we talk about other ap applications of carbon capture uh, outside of direct air capture, at which Kirk is much more expert, you know, I, I, I and, and we'll get into what Doomberg wrote about in a, in a, in a little bit. There's a there's a connection here. Um, I, I do think, as we prove, both technical and starting to get over some hurdles economically and particularly with what, again, the IRA provides, you know, you start to think about um, physically removing enough CO2 to then completely offset what you generate uh, burning oil and natural gas, then, yeah, I think, you know, I, th I think the industry has once again proven that give it a problem, give it an incentive, it's going to figure it out. I have no idea why Oxy would spend money on this deal. I looked at the deal early on. I don't understand direct air capture. It makes no sense to me scientifically. Maybe we need someone that's really smart to come on the show and try to explain how taking air in from the environment and capturing the CO2 actually works. Because what is CO2? It's like 0.4%. It's, it's like, tiny and no, they have to actually four. burn a bunch of... 0.04%. They yeah. have to burn a bunch of... Uh, fossil fuels to to actually capture the air unless they're running them on renewables. But if you ever look yeah, at the, these, go ahead. The, the point was in in terms of okay, let's where do you locate these things? Do you locate them where you're at 004 percent CO two concentration, or do you co locate them uh, where the concentration is higher, like next to industrial facilities where it makes more sense? So the lower the CO two concentration goes the higher mm -hmm. the energy intensity of the process and so you're working against yourself right the energy the energy tax on the process in just locating a facility out in the middle of nowhere is is ridiculously high so i know nothing technologically about any of this and i do need to to bone up on this but i will say if warren buffett is buying from bill gates i'm probably getting screwed you absolutely yeah that, yes you are so <laughs> there's there's something that has that but mark Ro or kirk roll into to the doomberg story i mean it's I, actually i think this is the real perfect point. timing it's so doomberg wrote a great piece about it was never about emissions and the climate narrative has evolved from like global warming to climate change to climate crisis to the recent term global boiling which set Doomberg off to write a piece. There's been this shift in focus. It's it's ever so slight, but if you listen to sort of the environmentalists here, the shift in focus has been from carbon emissions to the act of burning fossil fuels. 
So it's not the emissions anymore. It's about the fact that we're just burning fossil fuels in general. Now, well, burning burning is bad. Just just burning is bad. And they, and they've even taken it a step further. If you listen, they they talk about even producing them. You you hear that too. Just the act of producing them, they should stay in the ground. We're starting to hear that too. And and well, which, go ahead. It's interesting. There's a couple of of real examples in there as we as we approach COP twenty eight, which is I believe the UAE. You you have. Uh, a leadership that has been vocal about, and certainly if if we can solve the emissions issue related to burning hydrocarbons, that ought to be a good thing, right? And the former climate chief of the UN, who was instrumental in uh, the Paris Protocols, uh, the Paris Agreement, um, Chris, I think Christina Figueres. Anyway, she's um, she's really taken up very proactively and very aggressively this anti burning um, pushback on all this. And if we're solving the problem and you tell me that that's unacceptable, then the emissions really weren't the problem, were they? I mean, especially- We're we're seeing- Go ahead. No, We're seeing this in the narrative. Yeah, these are the same people that are have been critical, the, the negative part of the IRA, speaking of, going all the way to the beginning, is the fact that IRA supports the development of CCS technologies. Because CCS is really, and, and, and there's quite a few CCS technologies that I'm aware of that are just about to reach commercialization. Um, I think that's going to be a game changer. And I think if you think about the climate as a business, which Doomberg has done multiple pieces on, this is a big, basically propaganda to promote an industry for a few people to make a lot of money, which I don't necessarily hate them for doing that. We all promote through marketing and self-promotion to some degree. But I think once you have CCS technologies flourish, it's going to create a alternative to burning fossil fuels and about emissions. Because when oil and gas companies say, hey, we're down to zero emissions through whatever technology, there's quite a few good ones out there it's going to create. Um, it's going to be an economic versus economic battle. But, yeah. But before the economic versus economic battle happens, you've got to win the war of propaganda, and that's what Doomberg's saying is that many people are just against burning fossil fuels in general. And if you start, if you turn off the the spigot of fossil fuels, getting them restarted is going to be really hard. Now, that, thank God we have small independent oil and gas companies. Chuck going right back. Five to, guys in a rusty. Five pickup. guys in a rusty pickup. We need them on that wall. <laughs> you want them on that. We wall. want them. On we that want wall. them on that wall. <laughs> yeah, they even brought up uh, the case of Net Power as an example of you know that same problem, so to speak, getting solved in a fairly ingenious way. Right? Okay, you're burning natural gas, <laughs> but we figured out a way to basically capture and zero out the uh, carbon footprint. Yeah, we need to we need to sit down with Danny Rice and get him to walk us through that because that, that sounded pretty fascinating. I mean, at the end of the day, unless, you know, the, the, the world elites are going to be able to sit around and tell us how to do things, they're going to be against it. I mean, that, that's just... Well, they already I have hate- a GPS in my car, so... They're, they're about to get everything. I was thinking of moving to Utah, and that clinched it. No, so, <laughs> it's over. Yeah, it's over. The um, so let's get back to that boiling point because Mark, you sent a, a really fascinating tweet over by Joe Bastardi, who just by way of background has been my dad's favorite weather guy for a million years. Dad used to talk about listening to him on the radio every morning. He's a very active tweeter. Obviously, as qualified as anyone on the planet he's to, an talk, about, to no. talk about climate, and he's a Texas Aggie. So that's right. And don't hold that and, against and, him. And his, <clears throat> his principle is grounded in something called I had breakfast with him long ago before he spoke at Intercom long ago. And it was just fascinating to hear him talk about, you know, the historical analogs. And I may not have that, um, you know, that, that, analytical basis precisely correct, but less reliant on predictive simulation and more reliant upon looking at, 
you know, the, the parameters of, of comparative analogs from historical weather events and, and climate patterns. So, yeah, he's a really fascinating guy, a uh, power lifter as well, I think, or bodybuilder or something. And he's, um, he's, he's fairly outspoken. I, I do wish one thing about his tweets, though, that he would take a little more time to, to, to maybe clean up the typos and, and, and some of the grammar, but it's some, some, some of the tweets are almost indecipherable, but big Joe's so, a good, good dude. So the, so the tweet you sent, I'm going to paraphrase, but you take over Mark and run with it. It basically said for all the talk this summer of boiling and heat, if you look at all of the data in aggregate, it's kind of been a somewhat mildish summer. Did I get that right? Basically it's a lower 48 Canada and Mexico map, which is, shaded mostly blue and light blue and deeper blues across the, you know, the West coast up through the upper Midwest, up into Canada and the East coast. And, and certainly we all know very well, especially where you guys are sitting right now, that orange red um, dome of misery sits over mostly Texas and a little bit in New Mexico. Point is, if you, if you average all that out, then you're looking at normal to below to below normal temperatures across the, much of North America, where the headlines of the narrative have all been about things like global boiling and climate change and, mm-hmm. and all of that. When, when, when the data is saying that, you know, we're normal to below normal on a, an aggregate U S lower 48 and North American basis. One of my favorite things to say when discussing current weather and how it's driven by climate change is to always ask the person, Tell me the the weather pattern that would disprove climate change. Lay it out for me. What what is that? And and that you always get a bunch of oh uh, I don't know I don't know. And I go well how can weather prove climate change, but it can't disprove it? Doesn't that by definition mean it can't prove it? Damn anyway. Chuck, you heard it here. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we're we're making our wish list. We're trying to get Danny Rice to come on the podcast. We want Joe Basardi to come on the podcast. He'd be great. And I just don't know how we can let this moment pass without some irony on Hurricane Hillary hitting <laughs> California. <laughs> California. <laughs> I, I, I be- saw I saw a couple of just just interject some humorous to me couple of Babylon B headlines. One was uh, Hurricane Hillary makes landfall in California and immediately destroys 30,000 emails. <laughs> and, 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 uh, Russian, Russian interference is blamed for the, the poor performance of Hurricane Hillary because it, you know, it, it dissipated pretty quickly <laughs> and now it's, it's subtropical. So I saw some great surf in Newport beach though. Like there was the surfers were out. They were out um, some giant waves, so it was it was nice to see hurricanes. Usually, there's there's a bright side, depending on where it's hitting. But if you're there before it hits, or you're on the edge of it, sometimes it pushes really good surf. And in this case, there was some great surf on the uh, some of the beaches in California. There good we for go. them. There we go. For, fortunately, there was no seeming uh, major or any any type of damage that would would require a you know a significant delay or shutdown at uh, at the port of Los Angeles which yeah given our yeah. given our problems of the past few years uh that's actually a good point mark it yeah. really is. well they did say, they did say that there was damage um uh, the reporter i heard on the on the radio on the drive this morning was talking about uh, some conversations that she had had with farmers in the central and in imperial valley and so there's there's going to be some impact on some key you know some key ag products that are coming out of that part of the world we just don't know what that impact's going to be so get ready to pay more for tomatoes and almonds got it got it all right do we have a finger of the week I'm giving it to Cruise Automation, those bastards. <laughs> <laughs> for taking my charging spot, for ruining my EV experience, and for screwing up what's already a screwed up city of San Francisco. But you can, what do you guys think? 
I done. That sounds great. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I third that notion. <laughs> so one one last thing. Uh, the interesting point about Mark Andreessen on Rogan is he was talking about San Francisco. And if you look at the Venn diagram, where literally it's two circles right on top of each other, it's San Francisco, and it's literally the home of the LSD experiments, you yeah. know, all the hippie rock, the doors, Jimi Hendrix, all that sort of stuff. And it's also the home of AI and all these mm -hmm. great things. And his conclusion on it is it just it just attracts the fringe and the brilliance comes out of the fringe. <laughs> the Mansons come out of the fringe. I mean, cults exist in San Francisco and that's why it can be the weird wacky place that creates. Okay. Everything. So you're talking to one of our colleagues who happens to be in one of the creative spots of our country, Nashville, defend Nashville, Mark. Cause I don't think that same environment is in Nashville. It, it, it Historically has not been, although I will tell you uh, since it's been 15, 17 years ago that I became a three, four times a year regular uh, visitor in Nashville, it's, it's changed pretty considerably. You've had a tremendous amount of, of growth and changing demographics of, and changing politics of, of the um, Metro Nashville area. And so, um, I would say it, it's it's far from the the case that San Francisco presents, but um, you know it, it is it is rapidly changing to be um, I think a much more progressive major U.S. city, and I'll I'll just leave it at that. So he's saying he's not telling us exactly whether he thinks good music will continue to come out of Nashville or not. Well. As I like well, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. I think. I look. I think most of the mainstream <laughs> Nashville stuff is. Uh, no offense to any bro aficionados in the room, but I think. I think. Um, country has been completely homogenized, at least in the mainstream. You know, it, it's like the same five lyrical constructs and the same spoken like a true musicians touch. playing. Yeah, well, right. I mean, so. as a true Texas country music guy, I think when uh, Chet Atkins took the slide guitar out of uh, country music, made it that bastard pop stuff, it all went downhill. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right, everybody. If you liked BDE, please subscribe. Please tell your friends about it. We will uh, be next. Be back next week. Good to see you, Mark. Cheers. Safe travels Good to back, see you guys. Mark.